Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have a special guest speaker this morning. Amen. Uh, thank you for everyone who came to watch the show. Thanks for the for giving us the idea to watch that show last night. Thank you, Andrew, for all the tech support beforehand. We did get it to work. We'll watch it. We set it on the phone Wi Fi. But it, we were wondering if it was going to work, but it finally started. Once the show started, it started. So praise God for that. Yeah. If you get a chance to see it, it's really good. Don't talk to me next year. There is an offering plate in the back. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do more offering here soon. Uh, there are uh, daily breads. I, I bring my mouth on coffee today. So there are daily breads back there. And I think the newest one is out there too. Is that, yes, it is. Okay. Well, I think I have one of those. Uh, does anyone have any announcements or special prayer requests? Uh, friends who have surgery coming to her. Is it surgery or just test? Two, two tests. Two tests. Right. Two. Great. Someone started raising their hand. I think I saw it. Maybe the MRI on your shoulder. Oh. Uh, I had an MRI on my brain and I found one, so maybe they'll find your shoulder. I've got proof now. I've got pictures. Uh, pray for Andy. Continue to pray for Pastor Mike. Gene, how are you feeling? Awesome. Legs better. Chasing him around, sorry. <laughs> How's Rita? She's doing fine. So, uh, please keep my mom in your prayers too. She has some diabetes issues. And uh, continue to pray for our nation. And uh, pray that the vaccine will be made and everything will be back to the way it was mostly. It will eventually. Praise God for that. Brian, would you like to Father, we just thank you again for being able to be here and gather together. Thank you again for the rain. Many needed it. Praying for it. Thank you for that answer prayer. Lord, we just thank you that you sustain many that we know. Rita, Gene Clay, Pastor Mark Miller. Thank you. 
Pastor Mike, we gotta sing happy birthday to Allie first. Oh, let's do. I can use this thing about too. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. It's so easy to remember. People like Allie when they were little squirts running around here. It's a little too easy to remember. It's real easy to remember things that we can do. 50 years ago and can't do anymore. Thank you all for praying. This is going to be week by week. I'll bring you up to date what's been going on because people have been asking. Right now, my cardiologist is reducing the amount of the medication that slows my heart rate. So it's allowing it to be a little bit faster. Uh, we've got to monitor carefully the blood pressure. Thankfully, the Lord, I haven't been having very many episodes with those those slow palpitations. So I'm glad about that because that was. But now it's working in the other direction, so we just have to see how that goes. Um, I have an appointment at the end of the month with the cardiologist, and just prior to that, I go to see another specialist at Carl. Um, Electrophysiology. For all of you in the medical, you, that probably makes sense, but I, I've got to see that person. So, uh, as for Jean, she's seen an orthopedist about her knee, and there are some other tests scheduled to go along with the EEG and all that. So, we're we all come to the point we start dealing with falling apart. <laughs> but the Lord is good. And I want to address that this morning. I want us to turn to Romans in the fifth chapter. But lest I carry on, you all need to know that God is to be praised. And I... I just am very, very grateful to know that everybody is praying and keeping in touch. And, um, there are a lot of things for which to be thankful. I just can't take time to mention them all now. So thank you to everybody. Let's look at Romans in the fifth chapter because we're the last time I preached. We talked about hope that rests in the, the rapture that awaits us. Today, we're going to look at what Paul says about hope in the trials of life. I was sharing with I was sharing with Andy just been looking at a lot of portions of scripture and having a lot of things impressed on me. Some of them are very uplifting. Some of them, God is saying, you need to shape up here. And this is one of those. Having hope in the trials of life. Don, you pray if you would, please, before we spend time in the Bible. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you for 
this time that we can be here this morning. We thank you that Mike is here with us today. And we just ask that you give us your understanding and guidance and direction as we look into your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, God. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, therefore, and we'll address that. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We'll go on, but we want to take this up right now. We're going to talk about the foundation of our hope, the formation of hope, and the function of hope. I decided a long time ago, and I like that, and I have that in my margin somewhere, that I like approaching these opening verses of Romans that way. And not only that, it's, it's alliterated, and that's an amazing thing. The foundation to our hope rests, of course, in the person of Jesus Christ. But we all understand that whatever in anything we do, there must be foundational principles involved in those things. There are people who can, can go on and on and on about views of Scripture, but they have foundational problems in understanding basic elemental aspects of the truths of the Bible. And I think this goes back years ago. Gene was teaching at the Y in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and on that gymnastics team with which she helped, there was a, a little gal, extremely talented. Her name was Lizzie. She was extremely talented. She could do all kinds of neat tricks on every piece of the apparatus and all that but when it came to connecting moves she had never been taught basic elements and so she had difficulty putting them together foundational things are so important now in the foundation to our hope it begins in the fact that we're saved people and paul is addressing folk who have come to Christ to be saved. When he tells us we're justified by faith, we have peace with God through Christ, we're sustained in this, we'll view it all. But think about the ways in which the Bible addresses our lives when it talks about us coming to Christ to be saved. We're taught that we're born again that's John chapter 3. We're taught in Ephesians chapter 2 that we, have, we are dead and we're brought to life by Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, we are taught we're brought out of darkness into light. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul tells us the mind has been blinded by Satan to the truth of the gospel. But when the light of the gospel shines upon the heart and a person comes to Christ to be saved, everything's changed. Rather than the mind being blinded, the mind is now eliminated as Brian was praying. The mind is eliminated and the Spirit of God has soil of the mind in which to teach us truths of the scripture. Notice two things that are mentioned that are involved when God saves us. First of all, we're justified, and then we have peace with God. And we're going to talk a bit about justification here. Justification, often we, we view it as just as if we never sinned. Justification has the idea of vindication. 
of verifying something, of stamping approval on something, of validating something. We are justified before God by our faith in Jesus Christ. God declares us righteous. And then he says, that person belongs to me. He's justified before my sight. He's made righteous. Now, look back, y'all, at Romans chapter 3. And we see Paul explaining this. Romans chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading at verse 25. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, and this is the end of a sentence of explanation about faith in Christ to save us. But he's speaking about Christ, <clears throat> whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Now look here, y'all. To declare, I see declaration this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. How, <clears throat> this is open for a response, how must a just God deal with the unrighteous sinner? Oh, he does. Condemnation. I thought you meant separation. Oh, separation. The unjust sinner is going to face the condemnation of hell. But what happens? And, and Paul in Romans chapter 3 explains all of sin and comes short of God's glory. But Christ is the answer. And a just God is able to justify the sinner who will come by faith to Jesus Christ for his righteousness, for his salvation. Therefore, being justified by faith, Romans 5 is telling us, we have this peace with God. <clears throat> so, justification... Uh, Turn to James, because this is this often stumbles people and is something we need to address. I was thinking about this this morning. Justification deals with the fact that God takes the sinner, declares him righteous, and says, you're justified in my sight. You're vindicated. You're validated. Whatever whichever of those principles, words you want to use to describe the principle. But justification also has to do with how God views the things that we do in our lives in honor to Jesus Christ, that we do in faith toward the truths that rest in Christ. Look at James chapter 2 and verse 21. And look at this carefully. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar? See then that faith wrought with his works and works was made perfect. Now a lot of times if we don't if we don't have it clear in our thinking what justification is, we're going to look at that and say, wait a minute. Works doesn't save anybody. Amen? Yes. Works will save no one. So justification is the declaration, the announcement to vindicate the sinner who has come by faith to Jesus Christ. That's the connection of justification in our salvation to the righteousness we have 
And when that saved person is endeavoring in his life to the, the choices that he's making, the things that he's doing in honor to Jesus Christ because it's what's motivated in his heart, like Abraham, it's justified before God. It's accepted. Am I being clear? I don't want anybody to speak up, but if I'm not being clear, you can put up your hand because we need to we need to see this. A lot of people are stumbled by this verse in James. But if we know what justification is and how it relates in our salvation, then we see what James is talking about here. Because James' whole point is genuine faith proves itself. Isn't that what James teaches us? Genuine faith proves itself. And that is why he says Abraham was justified by his work. Abraham had already believed God for righteousness. Now what he's doing in offering Isaac back there in Genesis 22 is completely an accepted act of faith before God. And that's what James means. So, back here to Romans. That wasn't even in my notes, you know. We're justified. Give me, give me another word to explain justification. Somebody. We just went through it. Validation. Vindication. Satan comes and accuses us. What happens? Jesus, our advocate, says to the Father, this is, this is a scenario. No, you don't. You're mine. They're justified. Now, we have peace given to us in our salvation. We're justified by faith. And by virtue of that, we have peace peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Two important things to learn about this, and this is the word that would be equivalent to the Old Testament shalom. This word teaches us not only that hostility has ceased, that's, that's one view, that's one aspect of looking at peace, if I'm at peace with the other guy, he's no longer ready to punch my lights out. But also, this word conveys that now, not only is, has hostility ceased, but we have a condition of blessing and, get this y'all, security. I've got your back. To use a phrase. Not to demean the truth of peace from God but we have the confidence that we belong to him he's caring for us he's doing for us what's needful that's involved in having peace as Paul says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ this word for peace is interesting too because it talks about taking something that has been pulled apart, separated, and binding it together. Binding it together. Really, really tying the knot. Look at Psalm 29. Psalm 29 verse 10. The Lord sits upon the flood, yea, the Lord sits king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. We have peace with God 
And it's very important that that peace we have with God that we recognize is it is that which God does. God is the one who establishes peace. People who say they have made peace with God need to be very, very sure that God has made peace with them because it only comes through Jesus Christ. Amen. It only comes through Christ and it is completely God's work. Peace with God. And this peace comes through Jesus Christ. Look at um, look back at John chapter 3. Verse 18. John chapter 3 and verse 18. He that believes on him, that means Christ, he that believes on him is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Peace comes through Jesus Christ. You're in John, turn to John chapter 5 and look at verse 23. Well, actually 22. The Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son honors not the Father who has sent him. Verily, verily, I say to you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Now, the next thing in our foundation not only is that which applies to our salvation, but that which applies to our sanctification of life. That is living the Christian life. And that's generally when we use the word sanctification, we're talking about living the Christian life. The sanctified life. Sanctification comes from a word that relates to holy, being set apart for God's use. So when we talk about sanctification of life, we talk about living the Christian life. When we come to Christ to be saved, at the point in time we, we trust Christ, when God saves a person, He sees them complete in heaven. On earth, He's working with us. He's working through us. He is slowly but surely working in us and perfecting us, bringing us to that maturity and completion. And it is, it is definitely a process. The person of our sanctification is Christ. By whom, that's referring back to our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Jesus is the one by whom and for whose sake we are sanctified in our living. It is by Jesus Christ, it is for his sake that God slowly but surely is working to perfect us. And at whatever point we are in our walk with the Lord, whatever's coming into our lives, God is the one who is at work to make the things transpire that need to be transpired. Sometimes He's doing things with us because we need to shape up. Sometimes He's doing with us things 
so that others will observe. Most of the time, we can see in Scripture, both things are taking place. We're developing as God wants us to develop, and what's happening in our lives is noticed by other people. By whom we have access is Christ. And y'all, we have looked many, many times. Uh, Hebrews in the fourth chapter talking about Jesus, our great high priest, who is ready and willing to give us mercy and grace to help in time of need. Hebrews chapter 12, we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's by virtue of the Lord Jesus that we keep on keeping on, y'all. I read an interesting thing one time. The point being, we aren't going to accomplish, apart from our Lord's strength and, and remaining focused, that He has things well in hand and is working to conform us. But there was um, Sir Arthur James Balfour. He at this time, I think this was back just post World War II, Prime Minister of England. He was addressing the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and he had the subject, the moral values which unite nations. That gets our attention, United Nations. But he had these subjects, or he had these points, knowledge, commerce, diplomacy, friendship, compassion, understanding. And he made quite a speech saying that these things are all important to the United Nations. The account says there was a Japanese student who asked him, what about Jesus Christ? Balfour had no response. And that, that perception was part of what spurred the uniting of nations. And y'all, I don't care how, how great the magnitude is of something that's done or how small it is down to giving a cup of cold water to somebody if it's not done in Jesus name it's not going to amount to anything we are not going to amount to anything in this walk with the Lord if we aren't doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus and by his strength and y'all, every single one of us in here, almost every single one of us in here, can acknowledge the fact that we have many times in our lives where we try to tackle something on our own and it doesn't happen. Well, that's, that's taken up another point. We have access by faith into this grace. And that looks at the fact that we have a responsibility as well as an accountability before God to walk with Him, to live as He designs us to live. And here's something very good to see about persevering in this. No need to be disheartened. He says, in which you stand, and I want us to look at that word I don't know if anybody would have it translated differently in which we stand and rejoice. That word stand is a tense that looks at something that took place at a point and the results are always right to the present. Paul says you came to Christ to be saved and the impact of that is continuing to work in your life until right now. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord and amen. And if anybody wants to wave their hand, that's all right. That's looking at our security, everybody. And why can we say that? Because when God saves a person, 
he saves them to keep them. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. I have got a yawn out of Andrew. <laughs> it's very good to be here. Just in case you can't tell. Now we said keep on keeping on. I want to. I want to state some, some things that have impacted me illustrative. There was a fellow named Gibbon. He wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Some of us have probably read that. It's a <coughs> massive thing. It took him 20 years. 20 years. There was a fellow named Bancroft who wrote a history of the United States. I don't know when he lived. It took him 26 years to write it. There was a man named Lyman Beecher who had a message that he preached countless times over his ministry titled The Government of God. He was always changing it, but he continued to see principles in Scripture that just worked into that message, and that's what he did. There was a fellow named Marcus Mortan. 16 times what I read said that he ran for the governor of Massachusetts until he finally won. Anybody want to take a guess by how many votes? One vote. He ran 16 times. We have access to this grace from God which has saved us justified us, brought us our peace, and we continue to stand in that, y'all. Whatever comes along, God's at work and God doesn't let go of us. So, Paul says, he glories, now this is the tough part, in tribulations. The word tribulation is a word that talks about having being distressed in the mind as well as being afflicted in the body. It's a very broad, a, a, a broadly applied word. But Paul says he glories in tribulation. But notice why. At the end of verse 2, he rejoices in hope of the glory of God. God has saved us to bring glory to himself. God is at work to bring glory to himself. What is the very best thing that any of us can do in our lives is to bring glory to God. How many times do we hear somebody say, you've got to do what's best for you? You know, that's not necessarily a good perspective. Doing what is best for me is to bring, doing what makes, make the choices that brings glory to God. That's the best thing. Not based on what I want, but what is the thing in this that faces me that is going to bring glory to God. And Paul says, with all this in mind, I rejoice in hope. I have hope in the glory of God. What God's doing is going to bring glory to himself. So he glories in tribulations. All the problems and difficulties that entered Paul's life and read the first chapter of 2 Corinthians. And Paul talks about it. He says, knowing that this tribulation works patience. When he says that tribulation works patience, he's talking about the formation. We've all we've talked about the foundation. Here's the formation of hope. Tribulation works patience. I learn a correct attitude. I'm being a poor student right now. If y'all want to know, I, I, I'm I'm trying to come to having the right perspective. 
Paul says it works patience making the correct choices the right decisions no matter what's going on keeping the proper outlook no matter what's going on and patience works experience look at God's faithfulness in the past and take encouragement for right now and that is a tremendously helpful thing experience works hope we can be encouraged for what is ahead because God is working that in us which is going to bring glory to himself either in what transpires in our lives or what transpires in the lives of others bringing glory to himself and let's notice then hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given unto us hope makes not ashamed y'all sometimes we don't have the perspective that God wants us to have and sometimes the difficulties that come our way whether to the mind or the body can be very trying but we we can have confidence the fact that when we're when we're acknowledging the Lord at work and we're seeking to walk with him we aren't going to go away empty we aren't going to be left holding the bag we aren't going to be saying I'm sorry I depended on God that doesn't happen because the love of God God's love for us and the love that we have we want to acknowledge that God is worth all that is shed abroad in the whole by the Holy Spirit who's given to us God gave his son for us he justified it he's declared peace with us he's sustaining us and what he's doing in our lives he's doing to bring glory to himself and he teaches us to have confidence in that thing and we can praise the Lord for it Tim, would you have prayer and dismiss us, please?